All right, for the next item, I am going to uh, provide the board an update from our health committee uh, via health and safety conditions related to COVID-19. And Dr. Teigen is coming forward to provide that presentation for the board. And of course, we look forward to answering any questions you may have as well. Dr. Teigen. Good afternoon, Chairperson Shea, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. Thank you for giving me an opportunity again to provide an update from the HCPS Health Committee this afternoon. Today's agenda includes the current transmission level for Henrico, a quick review of the key prevention strategies, an update on efforts to vaccinate our five to 11 year olds and provide boosters to those 12 and older. A reminder about expectations around masks and masking and additional opportunities for COVID-19 testing and a change in isolation and quarantine guidance adopted by the CDC previously and by the VDH recently. As has become the norm, I will start with the transmission level. On Monday, the VDH released the most recent health data for Henrico County. The transmission level within Henrico remains at the highest level. Based on the seven day data from January 1st to January 8th, the number of new cases per 100,000 was up to 1,436, and the percentage of PCR tests that were positive was 32.8%. Now let's discuss the school impact. As we examine the level of school impact, it's important to note that due to winter break and inclement weather, weather our data represents only two school days. We continue to monitor student and staff, staff absence rates. And while the overall student attendance was 94.2% for the compar comparable two days in 2019, last week the overall student attendance was 82.9%. The staff capacity remains strained, and this is due to ongoing staffing shortages combined with isolations and quarantines of staff and or their children. Yesterday, we saw teacher absences decline slightly with 395 absences and approximately 68% substitute fill rate. Through the support of the additional permanent substitutes, our regular substitutes and central office staff and teacher co coverages, we have continued the important operation of serving students in our schools. Before I leave this slide, I would like to note that you'll see in lime green at the bottom that beginning on January 1 of 2022, the Virginia Department of Health is using a revised COVID-19 outbreak definition. The new definition is three or more lab confirmed COVID-19 cases who are epidemiologically linked within a 14 day period without another more likely source of exposure. Given the high level of transmission that we are currently experiencing in Henrico County, I felt it might be good to review the nine key strategies Henrico County Public Schools is to, committed to as a layered mitigation strategy to prevent the spread of COVID. As you'll recall from previous presentations, prevention is, our, is most effective when all strategies are layered together. Henrico County Public Schools has focused throughout the pandemic on the layering of all these prevention strategies, but I wanna highlight several for, as reminders for staff and families by focusing on the following strategies. Vaccinations, masks, testing, and isolation and quarantining. I will start by sharing what Henrico County Public Schools is doing about vaccinations. We continue to partner with the Virginia Department of Health to provide vaccination events for those needing their primary series or a booster. The role of the booster has changed 
and it is now part of the quarantining decision-making process for those individuals 18 and older. We do continue to focus on the five to 11 year olds receiving their initial two doses of the Pfizer vaccine. The second dose clinics at the four pilot elementary schools shown on the top of the slide were delayed until this week due to last week's inclement weather. If every student receives their second dose this week, an additional 295 HCPS students will be among those who have completed their primary vaccine series. And in two weeks, they will no longer need to quarantine if they are identified as a close contact to a positive case. Given the current success of in-school vaccination clinics at the four pilot schools, plans are currently underway to provide two doses of the Pfizer vaccine at the remainder of our Title I elementary schools in late January or early February. This will mean vaccinations will be available at an additional 16 elementary schools in the coming weeks. And those 16 schools are listed on the bottom of the slide. Adams, Ash, Baker, Chamberlain, Donahoe, Fair Oaks, Harvey, Highland Springs, Holiday, Johnson, Lakeside, Longdale, Montrose, Ratcliffe, Sandston, and Ward elementaries. As we've done at the pilot schools, only students enrolled in the school will be permitted to participate in these vaccination clinics. And student vaccinations will, re will require written parental consent and will occur during the school day without the parent required to be present. The Virginia Department of Health or one of their partner pharmacies will administer the vaccines to our students. The principals will be sharing information with their communities and the principals will work with their family advocates, their school nurses and social workers to reach families who might benefit from this opportunity for their child to be vaccinated at school. And if need be, someone will go to the home to assist families with completing the consent form. And the consent forms will again go out in multiple languages. In addition to the vaccines, we are also pivoting to offer boosters to our students ages 12 and up who, are, who have already completed their primary vaccine series six or more months ago. As you may recall, Vaccination clinics were held at Fairfield and Elko Middle Schools earlier in the fall. There were two clinics at each site three weeks apart to provide opportunities for 12 to 15 year olds to complete their Pfizer primary vaccination series. This resulted in over 385 primary doses being administered to our students. In addition, 144 family members received their boosters. Given the success of these clinics, we have asked our VDH partners to provide additional Saturday clinics so students may receive their boosters if they've completed their primary series at least six months ago. I am sure some wonder why the focus on boosters. It is important for families to know that based on new VDH guidance, Students who are 18 or older and have completed their primary vaccination series over six months ago and have not received their booster will be required to quarantine should they be identified as a close contact. The same is true for our staff members. While vaccines are the most important prevention strategy, masking is also very important. The current State Health Commissioner's Public Health Order and the CDC guidelines for schools require all students, teachers, staff, and visitors aged two and older to wear a mask indoors in, in public pre-K-12 settings, regardless of their vaccination status. Thus, HCPS requires masking within our schools as well as on our buses. Masking on buses is required by a federal order governing transportation. Masks should be well fitted, covering the mouth and nose, and be multi-layered. It is important to note 
that mask that that mask we have continued to supply at each school and work site are multi-layer and meet the CDC and VDH as well as OSHA requirements. In addition to the multi-layer mask provided to all staff, nearly 4,000 KN95 masks have been distributed across our 72 schools and program centers to provide staff an additional option for PPE. Youth KN95s have been ordered and will be distributed when they arrive. Medical grade N95 masks, which require individual fit testing, were provided to staff in our clinics, as well as certain special education staff who work in close, very close contact with students to do such things as diapering, toileting, hand over hand assistance, to name a few things. Face shields, gowns, and gloves were also provided to these staff for their optional use. So let's move to the third prevention strategy, which is testing. Each school continues to be stocked with take home kits for students and staff to use when they are being, they are presenting with COVID like symptoms. They are provided when a student or staff member has been identified as a close contact, as they may test for from home before returning to school. We understand that the testing supply chain has been strained, but we continue to monitor our supplies and proactively work to obtain kits as they are available. We continue to participate in the VISTA program and test our winter student athletes and our coaches on a weekly basis. In addition to the take home kits, we continue to partner with our local health district to make more testing available across our community as we have done with the vaccines. As supplies increase locally, we continue to find ways to make testing more accessible. We are proud of how our county government, our county manager, emergency manager, employee health, and others have prioritized community safety and the importance of assisting the school division in our ongoing efforts. We are grateful for their ongoing support We've shared the testing hotline provided by the county and the link to the test site information for the county in our communications to our families and our staff. Last of all, we have expressed our interest in participating in the test to stay program. The program is currently being piloted at only 10 school divisions across Virginia at this time. It's a program designed to keep healthy students in school rather than quarantining. With this program, unvaccinated students who are close contacts to a positive case may return to school as long as they are symptom free, take a daily at home test and provide negative test re result each day for five days. The test to stay program is not a weekly testing program for staff and staff are not able to participate in this program. Of course, the VDH continues to host community testing events. And as demonstrated by this week's COVID-19 testing schedule at the Richmond Raceway, as well as other sites throughout the county, there's ample opportunity. While most of these events occurred early in the week, additional COVID-19 testing events are planned for the foreseeable future. The Richmond Raceway will be operating as a community testing center from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. on Saturdays, Sundays, Mondays, and Tuesdays, beginning with this Saturday. Appointments are required for COVID-19 testing at the CTC Community Testing Center. Individuals can schedule an appointment up to three days in advance. So this brings us up to the updated isolation and quarantine guidelines from the CDC and VDH. 
You know, finally, we, as we continue to monitor and consider the latest guidance from the health experts, I want to share updated information about HCPS's isolation and quarantine guidance. The conversation about reducing isolation and quarantine times began December 27th with the CDC releasing information with changes for the general public. After this guidance was released, we consulted our VDH partners who shared that school divisions should consider additional guidance related to K-12 education, which they felt would be forthcoming from the CDC. As expected, on January 6th, the CDC updated their isolation and quarantine webpage and its K-12 webpage to incorporate K-12 setting specific guidance, which included the reduced isolation and quarantine timelines. The next day, on January 7th, the Virginia Department of Health updated the when to end isolation and quarantine document, which reflected the new guidance from the CDC. As a reminder, we work with our VDH partners for contact tracing support and guidance, and it is important that our practices are in alignment with and supported by our local health district experts. Therefore, as we consider changes to our plans, we heavily consider their input. When the HCPS Health Committee met this past Monday, the latest guidance from the CDC and VDH were reviewed. Here is a summary of the new guidance compared to the previous guidance related to quarantining. The new guidance for close contacts who are not fully vaccinated, COVID testing is recommended on day five and the individual may return on day six if a negative test result, symptom free and 24 hour without fever reducing medication can be verified. Previously, close contacts had to test between days five to seven and return on day eight if they were a, a provided a negative test result, were symptom free and 24 hour fever free without fever reducing medication. The other change is related to vaccination status. The new guidance for eight, those 18 years old and older if they are eligible for a booster, they need to have received it to avoid quarantine. Previously, those 18 and older were not required to have a booster to avoid quarantine. The HCPS Health Committee recommended the new quarantine guidance be adopted for students and staff, and this recommendation was supported by leaders, the leadership team and thus will go into effect tomorrow, January 14th. Updates have been made to our flowchart for quarantining and our FAQ document to reflect the change and will be available as always on our website. And as promised, we always keep our families and staff up to date regarding any changes and will communicate this change to our stakeholders today. Out of an abundance of caution, the Health Committee did not recommend adjusting our current isolation practices at this time, despite the update in the new CDC and VDH guidelines on isolation. This decision was responsive to current, health, current local health conditions affecting HCPS, specifically the high level of community transmission. As a reminder, Isolation guidelines apply to those who have tested positive for COVID-19, while quarantine guidelines apply to those who are identified as close contacts to a positive case. The Health Committee will continue to include isolation timelines as a topic of consideration as we monitor local transmission and Henrico County Public Schools will update our stakeholders should any further adjustments be made to our isolation practices. And last, given the high level of community transmission, staff and families are asking about the criteria to shift a class or a school to remote learning. 
Senate Bill 1303 clearly states that divisions can only consider remote learning as a temporary measure when there are outbreaks at the classroom or school level. Only at that time and in con consultation with the Virginia Department of Health may consideration be given to a temporary shift to virtual learning for only such time as needed to control the outbreak. Simply put, it is a case-specific decision-making process related to classroom and school outbreaks, not community transmission levels, and each situation is unique. Again, metrics related to outbreaks or transmissions within schools are used rather than community transmission rates. The details of the number of cases, outbreaks, et cetera, are reviewed in collaboration with an epidemiologist from the Virginia Department of Health. This is the same process used for any other communicable disease, such as influenza or chickenpox. And I am happy to try to answer any questions you may have. Well, thank you for that presentation, Dr. Tigan. I would I'd have to say, based on the inbox and the telephone and anywhere we board members went this week, these were all very hot topics. So thank you so much. Um, let me see. Let's start virtually this afternoon. Um, Chair Shea, would you, do, do you have questions right. for Dr. Tigan? Sounds good. Thank you, Ms. Kinsella. Thank you, um, Dr. Tigan. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't start by just acknowledging um, both for our staff and for our families just how hard everything is right now um, related to uh, all the COVID things and um, the transmission rates and, and isolations and quarantines and instruction. And it is all hard for everyone. And so um, just a deep felt appreciation for all of our stakeholders and, and, and all the extra that they're pouring in um, right now. Um, Dr. Tigan, can you speak a little bit to, um, I know I've gotten some questions about um, why the guidance is different for vaccinated um, students and staff of vaccinated people versus unvaccinated people, um, provided that we are seeing um, breakthrough cases, um, particularly with the Omicron variant. Yes, the um, both the CDC and the Virginia Department of Health have not wavered on their um, guidance related to unvaccinated versus vaccinated students and participation in testing as well as quarantining. Um, my understanding is that this is related to the difference in um, transmission between um, individuals who are vaccinated versus those who are not. And so um, there, the, I guess easily said that there's less, it's less likely that someone who's fully vaccinated or has completed their primary series and or had their booster would transmit to someone else than someone who was unvaccinated. And so the guidance just has not, you know, continues to be that there is a difference in quarantining. Thank you for that clarity. Um, I also really appreciate the clarity on that, um, close to that last slide as to when would a class or school shift to remote. I know we've been getting a lot of those questions and um, I think you spelled it out very clearly in terms of, um, and let me just um, repeat it and you can repeat it back to make sure I heard correctly <laughs> and our constituents heard correctly that um, those sorts of decisions are driven in consultation with the VDH and it has to be be um, confirmed outbreaks through the VDH that would um, trigger some sort of uh, pivot to virtual. Correct. It is in consultation and based on the data within the classroom or within the school. And we have done that on the class. We have had to do that thus far this year on the classroom level in some of our schools thus far, correct? We have. Yeah. So, Very minimal. So yeah, this is something that we are are responsive um, to. Um, could you talk a little bit? I know there's a lot of buzz about how um, staffing could impact a closure. Um, could either you or uh, Dr. Cashwell speak to kind of any provisions or limitations there are there? Yeah. And when I say closure, excuse me, I don't mean closure, closure. I mean 
a pivot to um, other other modes. Sure, I'll tackle that one. Um, so I think, you know, as Dr. Teigen shared, when it's uh, looking at shifting to remote based on reasons related to COVID-19 transmission, I think she provided that answer, which is specifically that SB 1303 has that provision that uh, when there is an outbreak, uh, a school division could consider, again, in consultation with the VDH, that um, pivot to remote for the period of time, and that might be at the classroom or school level. And I think what you're asking, are there any provisions if, if staffing were to be of issue? That is not a provision within SB 1303 related to COVID. There is, um, uh, there are other um, governing factors for public schools in Virginia uh, that allow divisions up to 10 days of remote learning only in cases of an emergency, uh, a time when a school would need to uh, have an emergency closure. Uh, this specifically, the language in that uh, piece deal with things like inclement weather uh, and or other emergent situations, a power outage in a school that would impact the safety of students. And so if a division were to pivot to remote for that, again, unplanned remote learning day due to uh, an emergency closure, there is a provision within that requirement that school meals be provided uh, as well as uh, other specific services. So, I mean, I think there are some considerations in there uh, that might uh, constitute something like that if there were to be a true staffing emergency. Uh, but, you know, otherwise there is not a provision for such. And it, it sounds like it, it would have to be utilized on a very limited basis with the uh, cap of 10 days and the other services required. The services would be required, yes. And uh, just to piggyback on that, since you mentioned inclement weather, I, I, we've gotten a lot of that question as well. And I think that points to um, that when slash if we have another snow day, it's not as easy as just saying, oh, let's log in virtually. Is that what I'm hearing? It is. And, and you know, so uh, what's different this school year, along with that, uh, those governing factors for public schools I mentioned is that, you know, if you were to pivot to remote during an emergency closure, perhaps related to weather or snow, uh, there is the, um, you would have to provide meals, et cetera, for it to uh, constitute as a remote learning day. And so it's not to say that can't be accomplished, but there are lots of factors that have to be considered and how we make sure we we can provide those core services to our students, even if we don't open in person and we're to be remote. Uh, so I say that to say virtual learning uh, during a snow day is not off the table. It's certainly doable. And uh, we would intend to want to try to, to uh, leverage that option to the extent we're able. But that would mean uh, considering you know meals being served perhaps in advance, if not during the snow day, where it may be unsafe to operate food service curbside. Uh, chances are if we're closing during emergency weather, that'd be a safety consideration, uh, as well as thinking about uh, making sure that our staff and students have the materials and tools needed to do that, devices already at home. You know, obviously our, our previous snow days, which may be on folks' mind, we were coming right off of a two-week holiday, so there were some complicating factors there as well when you think about having devices on the ready, uh, et cetera. Uh, and of course, we want to make sure we've provided our uh, staff, particularly our teachers, with the right tools they have to engage sort of on a dime if it's an emergency closure uh, to be able to engage in remote learning. Thank you, Dr. Cashwell. Um, Dr. Teigen, you also mentioned um, access to K95 masks. Um, we are seeing a lot of data come out that's talking particularly with this variant about how important the kind of mask we are wearing. Um, and, you know, we've been providing multi-layer, well-fitting, um, but w we are uh, now providing access to KN95 masks. Can you just um, reiterate how our staff and or students um, access those um, if um, that is their desire. Currently, they um, currently there are only um, KN95 masks in the school for our staff. The others are are pending. They're coming. They've been on. They've been ordered, and we're anticipating their delivery. Um, that if a staff member, they just need to go in and see their um, COVID liaison or their principal. In each school, it's probably different where they are. But one of those two individuals can certainly. Um, 
direct them in the, you know, in the direction that they need to be for their school. And I'd like to add to that the student masks that we do have available are surgical multi-layer masks that meet that requirement. And while the KN95 mask is another option for staff, you know, well-fitted is important and the size of those, it's larger, so it wouldn't be a well-fitted uh, option uh, for most of our students. But the masks we do have an on hand are uh, appropriately sized for that um, use. But, you know, as Dr. Tiger and said with the additional youth KN95 mask coming in, that's yet another option for students should they wish to, to, to select that. Thank you so much. Uh, and then my final question um, relates to the test to stay program. Um, I know time, timelines are like nailing jello to a wall right now uh, but do we have maybe a rough idea on right now it's in um, 10 school divisions a rough idea when that might be able to be expanded to a division as large as ours no there has the um the feedback right now is you know the supply chain issues are impacting you know not only localities but the vdh as well and so um, most of the schools that are in the pilot are only doing um, limited schools within a division and so while we have expressed our interest and um, asked to be considered for that i don't know what they haven't indicated a timeline for coming back to say yes we would like to accept you into this program Thank you. Thank you for that update. Um, and that is all from me, Vice Chair Kinsella. Well, thank you, Chair Shea. And now, now from you, and I just want to take another opportunity, Ms. Atkins, to thank you for your service and contribution on the uh, Henrico Health Committee on behalf of the board. Um, what questions would you like to ask Dr. Tigan, or what information would you like to share? Thank you for that. Um, I want to start with thinking our county partners, our board of supervisors, uh, our manager, Mr. Vitokas, for providing families opportunities to whether they're getting a testing kit to take home, whether they're getting tested, uh, vaccinations. I had an opportunity to go and visit two sites. Um, I went to the Fairfield Recreation Center off of Burnham, and then I went over to Highland Springs later that afternoon, and we had folks wrapped around buildings. Uh, and, you know, just to see access in places where it's accessible makes a huge difference. And so I'm very, very grateful and thankful, not only for providing supplies and staffing to make it happen, but it's equally important to put it in locations where families can reach the services and reach the resources. And I just want to just pause and just thank them so much for being being methodical, being strategic and, and selecting places where our families can reach. And then secondly, to the health committee uh, meeting all the time, uh, whether we're meeting as a, a group together, discussing changes, or we are individually meeting with individuals. Uh, it, is, it is a lot of work. And I wanna take a moment just to acknowledge that. And, it's, and we're gonna continue. And it's important just to pause as well, just to say thank you. So uh, Mrs. Kinsella, I, I receive your thanks, but I think it's important to pass that along to every single person on this committee and then our partners whether it's VDH, you know, local health in Richmond or Henrico and surrounding areas that provide input, it's all needed and necessary. And then uh, my focus is less on questions. Uh, Chairwoman Shea took care of most of my questions, so thank you for that. So I could just focus on some of the thoughts that I was having during the presentation uh, and I also want to address our families, all of our families. Uh, I usually do Sandston, Henrik, uh, Highland Springs, and Verina. But I thought about all of our families um, within Henrico and outside of it, but specifically to our Henrico County Public School communities. And I, I too, I understand uh, being disappointed. I understand being angry. I have those emotions right now. And so I understand how hard this is 
in navigating this pandemic, you know, it feels like, you know, in the beginning we were in this infancy phase, we were learning and here we are two years later. And guess what? We do know more and we have done more. And human life paid and it's going to continue to pay the price for our wisdom. And I'm hopeful um, that it's that we remember that that there are human lives that were paid and are continuing to pay the price uh, for the wisdom that, that we have in navigating this. And so I thought to just offer um, a way to navigate this thing. And I thought about, um, instead of reinventing the wheel, what, what comes to mind, and it's Zig Ziglar, and I'll share that quote, it is, your attitude determines your altitude. It I've heard it over and over again, but it resonated me, resonated with me more right now. And I think as a community, our attitude towards the strategies that Dr. Cashwell presented, or perhaps you've seen some strategies somewhere else, that is going to truly determine how quickly we get to the goals. And for me, the goal right now is stability. It is sustainability and healthy lifestyles. And, you know, I, I'm, I apologize for taking this extended time, but I think it's important to do that just to share my thoughts right now. And our brain is certainly an organ. It can be trained like some of the other organs in our body. And I just ask our families to consider a positive attitude as we continue to navigate this thing. It is hard to do that. And having a positive attitude is a decision. It is truly a choice. And if you are that individual, or if it is this group that can't choose, it's okay. Just talk to a trusting individual that can help you figure it out because our attitude right now is either going to lead us and be our greatest asset, or it's going to be our biggest liability. And if we train it to see positivity, I believe that we're going to get to see and we are going to feel the best parts of us. And what motivates me to say this is so that our kids can see it too. And so if we collectively do that and we sure we are going to just show our best selves because we are choosing to train our brain to understand and see positivity then our children can see that. And we are being examples of behaviors that we want them to model in our school buildings. Our children, when they walk in our buildings, are certainly models or reflections or mirrors of what they see and what they hear. And so, I don't know to you if this sounds like a plea, if it sounds like begging, whatever word you choose. But our children are watching us. And, and as hard as this is, because it really is, if we can find a place to choose positivity towards our prevention strategies, we can get to where we want to be. So much quicker. So much quicker. Vice Chair, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ms. Atkins. Um, Reverend Cooper? Uh, thank you so much, Vice uh, Chair Kinsella. So, Dr. Titan, quickly, I know that we have uh, 72 facilities, not including all of our um, other programmatic centers, but do you have any kind of idea how many uh, at-home test uh, kits are currently on hand? Do you have any idea? I don't have the balance as of today because that's a moving target. <laughs> um, we started coming back from break with over 4,000 kits um, across the division. So with the production and distribution of supplies from manufacturers ebbing and flowing, what's our kind of contingency plan to ensure that we continue to have available to our, our schools the kits? Well, the VDH has prioritized us as of this division. We are a priority over other divisions to get supplies as, as they have their stock. We are also, um, Ms. Berry has been looking for other vendors that can also provide inventory for our students. 
So we want to make sure that our constituents and our students and staff know that we do have a plan in place. We are prioritized and we, we are pretty confident that given the current context that we would have available the tests. Yes, we are active. We have been actively on top of this since we came back from winter break. You Thank know, you we, so. were, we were proactive before the break, but then seeing what was happening over the break, trying to really um, go into, pre, you know, to more advanced um, problem solving for should there be a problem. I appreciate that. that that's very uh, comforting and um, confirming for me. So I know that we're all concerned about the impact um, transmission is having on our schools. And um, although transmission within our schools is moderate, uh, student absenteeism is slightly above uh, baseline and staff capacity is strained. Um, are we seeing any trends with certain schools or within certain districts with staffing challenges, higher student absenteeism? If so, what are we doing to kind of curtail that? Well, it, great question. Um, Dr. Grant and her team have been monitoring um, the teacher absences as well as other absences at schools. Um, they're prioritizing additional staff to those schools who have greater need, but also um, looking at what can, you know, what are some maybe other underlying causes for the absenteeism that she and her team can address, you know, to um, reduce the number of absenteeisms. Thanks so much for that, Dr. Hagen. And, um, how are we coming with the mandatory testing for our winter athletes? Is the vendor doing what we need? Are we on, on target for what we set out as our um, perspective? How are we coming with that? I, I would say that yes, we are. Um, last week, obviously, things were disrupted as a since it was not a normal school week due to the inclement weather, but we have been um, testing this week. We have made adjustments to our testing schedule, not our testing time. A couple of schools changed days. Uh, so to be responsive to um, their needs as far as, like us, they have um, employees that are quarantining or isolating and so, but they are still meeting our needs at our schools. Well, that's, that's awesome. And I'm glad that we're continuing to move forward with that path forward on that. Um, last question. So I just was thinking about, you know, when we had uh, virtual learning and we had available help desks for our technology piece is, have we ever, this might be to you too, Dr. Cash, but just, just, just thinking, right? A centralized uh, central office position to provide COVID-19 help desk functions for family and staff via email or phone call. Is, is there funding for a position like that? Have we considered a position like that? I mean, just, you know, answer questions about quarantine time, close contacts, testings, when to return to school, that kind of function. Coincidentally, we were having a similar discussion today. At one point we did, you might recall, we did stand up a Henrico Schools hotline and uh, we were able to man it um, by having folks who were assigned other duties to take on periods of time where they would be on uh, be able to respond to that hotline. So uh, it is an intensive effort, but we understand the need. You know, for example, we provide the county uh, testing hotline and some of the other hotlines, but we've often thought as a great service for our Henrico families besides our website kind of another one-stop shop would would it be uh, with so much going on possible to, uh, to stand up some sort of a hotline even if for limited hours so we actually have looked into that um, and, and to the extent we may be able to do so even for a temporary period of time just given uh, all that's going on we, we may be able to do that well I, I, that's awesome because for me just the centralization and you know with the vdh um and and the cdc it's a constantly moving target and you know it can be overwhelming you know what's the definition of close contact you know how do i determine you know if my child the quarantine is at the five is the ten just you know just speaking kind of just hypothetically in regards to the possibility i know that we have budgetary constraints and no staffing issues but for me personally just it just came to me that that might be something we could at least consider so i'm glad to hear that so look forward to hearing updates on that thank you dr tigan thank you dr Welcome. cashwell madam vice chair all right well thank you reverend cooper uh ms ogburn thank you um most of my questions or comments have been already said but i just have a couple um, could you give us some more on the test to stay program? Um, that is the most consistent thing I hear about in um, emails and phone calls is, is wanting to know 
more about how it works, but also when are we gonna, or are we going to fully implement it? So if you could give us a little bit more on that, if you've got any more information. Well, we, we have raised our hand to say we are interested. It, you know, so we're at the mercy of waiting for the VDH to come back to us or the VDOE to say that they have an opportunity for us to participate. Right. And what happens is, is if a child is considered a close um, contact to a positive case, then that child, rather than quarantining, the parent can agree to testing the child every morning. every morning. And so the intent would be that we would provide them with the number of test kits they need so that for five consecutive days, um, they would be able to test. Now they don't have to test on the weekend. So if they were to start on a Thursday, then Friday they would test. Saturday, Sunday, they would not need to test, but those are two days. And then um, Monday, Tuesday, they would test again and they would be negative before they came to school that morning. But the question I'm getting is, can we do this on our own? I'm getting this a lot. And can we do this and implement a program like this without VDH? I'm guessing I no, that. but no. I just think we need to get that information and out I, there. And I would point out that, you know, because this um, means moving away from the guidance of, the, of quarantining, so in this program, unvaccinated individuals who are close contacts would be able to return. So that's not currently a, a pr the protocol right. in place with the VDH or our own health protocol. So in order to do that would be under the supervision of the VDH and VDOE through the pilot program. I will point out it's a very limited pilot. I believe it's 10 school divisions and within those school divisions only like a, a select few schools. It isn't division wide. That's my understanding of the implementation. It was only first made available uh, at the very end of December with school divisions who are the pilot school division mm -hmm. just now beginning this program. So I think there's much to be learned from the program. Uh, certainly has some promise. Uh, we we want to be able to keep our students in school learning as they're healthy. And so it does have a lot of promise. We did raise our hands as Dr. Teigen say, said, and you know we're very interested to be a part of it. Um, but we'll want to certainly vet the success of the pilot, which is uh, brand new. Um, and, and as she also indicated, you know, next steps would be uh, hearing from them that we would right. be, you know, in the next phase. But I imagine given they're just at the very beginning stages, there's much to be learned. Um, and then certainly another limiting factor, even if we could deviate uh, perhaps from the guidelines, would be the number of test kits that would involve. And I think supply chain is, is also, you know, you're looking at going home rather with, than with one kit, but enough to cover your... Uh, uh, your a number of days testing. Well, and, and like I said, this is the most consistent question. People are hearing about it. They like the idea of it. And conceptually, sure, you know, I, the idea would work. But I, I think if we've learned nothing in the last two years, we really need to be careful how we proceed. So, you know, letting something pilot and, and trying it out, at, I think is, is obviously makes sense. The other thing I wanted to just kind of pass along that is not necessarily under the purview of the health committee per se to make decisions, but is implementing our testing. Um, I'm hearing from some parents privacy issues in how things are being done at, different schools. I mean, for example, I've got an email from a parent who says, my child was called out in the middle of class. If you're an unvaccinated athlete, essentially go to the office now for testing. And so, and I've had parents say that their kids were dismissed at a certain time because of exposure. They're having to walk through the cafeteria. Everybody sees them leaving. Things like that where some of our unvaccinated students feel like they're being spotlighted in some way that they are unvaccinated. And obviously not every student in the middle school or high school can be vaccinated. Some do have medical issues. Some think for whatever reason they've chosen not to be vaccinated. I'm just hoping that the message can be sent to our schools to be a little more sensitive about that, um, that issue. I, I have a number of parents who have expressed this concern that they're making the decision for whatever reason, you know, and, and that is a privacy matter. And if there's any way our schools can be a little more cognizant of identifying our kids who are unvaccinated, 
I, I think that's feedback that I'm getting consistently. That I know we are all doing the best that we can do. And that's what I tell the parents. Obviously, this is not intentional. It is not something that our schools are being callous and just, you know, not thinking. It's just all hands on deck right now. And I think our schools are doing, by and large, in 99% of cases, doing a great job. I just think there's maybe somebody wasn't thinking at that moment. But just to pass that along. We will pass that feedback on to our schools and, and make sure that at all times they're, they're mindful uh, of not only of student privacy, but uh, of the sensitive nature of the matter in general. And I just want to reiterate uh, for the record, though, that participation in the winter athletic program does not, is not a marker of your vaccination status. The program is for both vaccinated un and unvaccinated athletes. While it's required of those who are unvaccinated, individuals may be vaccinated and participating. Right. So participation in itself is not a disclosure of your vaccination right. status. Well, and I think um, sometimes people are making assumptions about, you know, just because a student left at this time, their privacy has been um, has been infringed upon in some way. I, I think, um, you know, I just wanted to share that is is a, a concern that I'm hearing about. But as everybody else has done, I'm gonna, I will say it too. Thank you for all you're doing and for Mrs. Atkins serving on this committee. Uh, certainly some of the most important work we're doing right now to keep our kids safe and in school. And, you know, kudos to the team for meeting over and working over winter break, because I know there was probably not a day off for a good number of our staff members. And, um, and you know, that, it's the unsung heroes, you know, just to me, it's, it's you know, we're, it, but thank you. It's, um, it's the least we can do to show our appreciation for all the hard work, but thank you. And Mrs. Kinsella, I am done. Thank you, Ms. Ogburn. Um, my colleagues certainly covered the bases, but as usual, I still have a few questions left. So I'll be, I'll try to be as quick as I can, but I do want to be thorough since I believe so many people will actually watch this back. Um, the presentation was so thorough and I'm grateful because with the transmission levels surging like they are, and we knew they would likely during break, um, I just wanna highlight, we still value health and safety, but even with that being said, I'm so glad that you know our PPE questions have been addressed. Um, student access to virtual assignments, um, their, their access, especially at the secondary level, um, I'm hearing for a lot of, from a lot of folks about that. Um, and even with the change to the uh, quarantine, it's still gonna impact our isolated, you know, our, our students that test positive. So is there any, are there any changes that we're expecting there? Um, because as Reverend Cooper mentioned, you know, the attendance rates in general, but um, also our um, students and family, our students that are testing positive. Are we changing anything? There, our goal has been uh, since the start of the year that if an individual is isolating or quarantining that they have access and they're well enough to participate, mind you. There are individuals who are, are sick and they're sick. So if you're marked quarantine but present in learning, there are a number of ways you can engage in learning and our teachers have the option uh, to leverage both virtual, uh, whatever might meet the needs of the student and family for virtual assignments and that sort of thing. Uh, we do have guidelines in place for our school about making sure our schools rather uh, that the, there are certain uh, common protocols where staff are uh, touching base with students who may be out regularly and so on setting deadlines for work that may need to be made up uh, because a student may not have virtual access during the time that they're on quarantine and so on so I'd say the bottom line is we continue to strive to work with our individual students and families because all cases are so different right. uh, during the time a, a student may be isolated or quarantined and we have provided our principals guidelines to share with their staff on making sure that's as smooth an experience as possible. Um, you know, but we'll continue to reiterate that, that guidance uh, to our schools, I think, um, to make sure that, that we're doing all we can to meet individual needs. And is that link, do we know, is that link included in the communication that's gonna go out to families? Probably after today's meeting as a result of, of this. I mean, I, 
I would imagine it's already out on our website. It, it is but also currently website. there, and it hasn't. There are no updates or changes right. to the documents, and it still exists. And I think we can uh, certainly reiterate the expectations around that to our our schools. I would appreciate that. I've gotten a lot of questions in the past week, um, specifically around around access and what do they do when their kids are out of school. So I appreciate that. Um, I'm really glad to see that. Um, We've added additional sites at our schools for vaccination because at last meeting in December, I only saw one of my schools there in the Brooklyn district and that was Dumbarton. And uh, I'm very pleased to see Holiday Johnson and Lakeside added. So thank you for realizing the need uh, in the Brooklyn district and providing that access. Um, let me see, earlier this week, the county manager declared a state of emergency so what does this declaration provide for? Does it provide money to hire additional staff or perhaps any employee bonuses? Or is it just uh, procurement related to, to purchase testing kits or other COVID supplies? The intent really was to be able to um, be able to procure things faster so that we could access them you know, the easiest way possible to make sure that our um, inventory was maintained. And so that was the intent. Okay. Um, and this next question is for principals everywhere on this Principal Appreciation Week. Um, as we move forward, is there any plan to remove the contact tracing duty from our principals and administrators in our buildings? It is currently, a sh you know, that they are sharing responsibilities between administrators, uh, nurses, um, different staff members, that, you know, there are different staff members in each building. That's been a school-based decision. Um, you know, we are still contact tracing with the level of transmission. Uh, we, we need to be able to maintain a healthy environment. And so that is a task that remains um, needing to be done. I'll just say if there are any additional funds um, to pay any additional staff um, to help remove this lift. I mean, every everyone is, it's all hands on deck. I understand that. Um, and we, we do have some positions that are designated for supporting um, contact tracing. Uh, if people are interested, please um, look on the website and reach out and ask questions because those positions um, are there and we'd love to have candidates that would like to and our assist. Substitute, our substitute positions are out there as well, right? Absolutely. And we anticipate emergent, um, emergency funding would not be used for that, would it? To perhaps pay more for substitutes or um, I know, uh, in online comments today, there were some comments, especially from board subs uh, regarding pay. So there's been no, has there been any discussion of that? Because if not, I'd like to just say it on the record and request it. Well, you know, when the positions were added, we did add more full-time positions with benefits, hoping to attract candidates, uh, which is a change, you know, and adding those to our schools. We do have full-time uh, with benefits, uh, perm sub positions, as well as we're looking for more daily subs. Um, and I think when you're talking about the state of emergency and, and whether that uh, brings any additional additional funding, no, it does not. It's a procurement strategy uh, leveraged by our, our government appropriately so in this time of emergency to ensure that uh, they're able to acquire the necessary supplies, uh, you know, to uh, have uh, important services like public education and so on uh, continue, but it, it doesn't have any additional funding. We have leveraged our ESSER funding, however, to uh, to uh, add these positions, add contact tracing positions, additional clinic assistance, and you know, to your point, making sure that while this is always going to feel like an extra heavy lift, that we have more hands on deck to help. The challenge has been uh, with the staffing shortages and being able to find candidates who uh, were able qualified candidates to bring on board. But we're going to continue to look. We've been pleased to onboard a number of staff so far. You've heard our updates around people transportation, our job fair held just this week at I think it was the Tuckahoe Library. Uh, we continue those 
uh, recruitment efforts and hope to have more people join our team uh, because we do have a number of positions that were created just during this uh, time with our ESSER funding to assist our schools with this. Well, thank you. I know especially at uh, one of my schools last week, we had, um, I heard from quite a few constituents about staffing. So I would have been remiss had I not mentioned it um, today. So thank you. Um, and then lastly, as we move forward um, and as the surge declines, has the committee um, discussed, are you guys talking about uh, perhaps some kind of trans transition, what comes next? Uh, perhaps working on your plan now, if this, then that. Um, and if you are, I'd just like to suggest that um, you please focus on the mindset shift as everyone has experienced different things throughout this pandemic and coming out of this pandemic um, is gonna affect everyone in different ways and how they reply, uh, respond to it. So I would just ask you to consider that. But are you guys working on that right now? We, we talk all the time about things that may, you know, that may we, we see maybe on the horizon that we wonder um, just to be prepared should things happen. Um, we have not specifically addressed mind shift here. Okay. I would ask that that be considered because even when transmission numbers come down, it, it's going to be um, interesting as, as we shift because it's going to mean different things to different folks who have experienced different things and almost well, and I, I would be remiss if years, I didn't right? say that, that actually Ms. Atkins kind of mentioned that this last week as far as starting to really think about, um, you know, the time period, out, you know, transition, thinking about transitioning out of COVID into what is the new normal. Right. Because so that's, that's definitely been on her mind and she shared that with the yeah, team. I think it's on everyone's mind. I mean, even children are saying, you know, it's been almost two years, right? Mm -hmm. So, so thank you. That's all I had. And thank you for that presentation. You're welcome. Thank you, Dr. Teigen, and again, uh, thanks to not only to you, to the health committee, and to our incredible HCPS team for the all hands on deck effort. That's each and every one of uh, the HCPS team members has uh, had to lift a heavier load of late, and it is not unnoticed.